It's the changing of the guard in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan's capital. Looming large over the soldiers is the towering figure of Turkmen Bashi, the self-styled great leader of all Turkmen. In the 13 years since the country declared its independence from the Soviet Union, Turkmen Bashi, or Super Murat Niyazov, to use his real name, has seen his statues and portraits dominate every public space in town. They make one thing clear, there'll be no changing of the political guard in Ashgabat. Turkmen Bashi has declared himself president for life. Ashgabat. It's Arabic. It means the city of love. But here in Turkmenistan, what it really means is an all-powerful president who's in love not so much with his country or his people, but himself. For the great Turkmen Bashi has built a one-party state based on a bizarre cult of personality. In public, ordinary Turkmens will proclaim their devotion to their leader, but their affection is contrived, motivated by a climate of fear and intimidation. Celebration is the key to their survival, but that makes ordinary Turkmens mere bit players in a perverse presidential pantomime. <laughs> For the Western media, the opportunities to visit Turkmenistan are few and far between. And those of us granted the dubious privilege are subjected to an endless stream of propaganda. Not so long ago, these goose-stepping soldiers would have sworn allegiance to far away Moscow. Now they take orders from just one man. Every year, a sort of people's parliament of hand-picked cronies is convened to give President Niyazov a collective pat on the back. Speakers compete to see who can lavish the most praise upon the president. It's a shameless display of state-sanctioned sycophancy. <laughs> Ministers are required to stand in the wings and take notes. Laws are passed on a whim and a presidential way. Turkmenistan Television dedicates itself to pumping out pictures of the president and political propaganda. Overseeing the broadcast are television executives who also know how to flatter. The teacher is fond of using the People's Parliament to issue bizarre edicts, mostly bans. It's forbidden to mention AIDS, have gold dental crowns, perform ballet or wear makeup on television. The 
president thinks presenters are already pretty enough. And who are TV executives to disagree? During our visit, we have constant companions, a burly government minder and a tour guide to show us around. At the top of the Arch of Neutrality, there is the statue of Mr. President. A statue which always rotates to face the sun. Ashgabat is little more than a dictator's Disneyland. And what makes this city all the more surreal is the fact that so few people actually live in it. Most of the four and a half million people live in rural Turkmenistan beyond those hills. But it's a select few who have the president's permission to be seen and heard. Just beyond the capital, we meet the president's good friend and acclaimed national hero, farm boss Murat Berry Sopyev. Murat Berry Sopyov takes us to meet what he says is a typical family. The camel has stage fright, offering up no milk. But in the presence of the village chieftain, the old woman spouts the party line. <laughs> After a brief encounter, the government minder decides the family is suddenly very busy. Let's go. So we drive to another house where a banquet awaits. The head of the house, yet another enthusiastic supporter of President Niazov. <laughs> The farmer's daughter recites a verse she's been learning at school from a book written by a self-styled poet and philosopher, none other than Niazov himself. It goes by the name Ruknama. A giant version ceremonially opens every night in Ashgabat. In this supposedly secular Muslim nation, it is the new Quran, Niazov's spiritual guide for the people. In schools, it's taught almost as theology. Children are expected to learn passages. So does anyone who wants to get a driver's license. The cult of personality cultivated here extends to putting Niazov up there with God. This three-storey high all-marble mosque has just been built in his hometown. It's one of the world's largest accommodating up to 25,000 worshippers at one time. Along with phrases from the Quran, the exterior wall is plastered with Niazov's favourite lines from the Ruknama. 
the building is also modestly named. There's plenty more slogans inside proclaiming the greatness of Turkmenbashi, but our cameras can't go in because the Imam says he needs the permission of the President himself. Now, this is one cleric who's not about to go around defying his earthly boss. His predecessor, the last Imam of Turkmenistan, is now serving a 22-year sentence for refusing to preach the Ruknama in the mosque. Niyazov has put his design inspiration on many other buildings around Ashgabat, like the magnificent edifice that is the National Museum. Первых у нас, естественно, генеральным проектировщиком является опять-таки сам президент Великий Сапармурат Туркменбаши Великий, потому что его мысли и он совпадает и самым лучшим мыслям великих архитекторов. Pride of place among the nation's treasures is a giant carpet. A smaller one features the replica of an old banknote showing the president before he went prematurely black. While Niazov's busy rewriting his country's history, this is all that's left of old Nyssa, one of the capitals of the Parthian kings from the 3rd century BC. But it's not Turkmenistan's archaeological sites that are of special interest to the present ruler. For President Niazov, what really matters is beneath Turkmenistan's deserts, its vast reserves of oil and natural gas worth tens of billions of dollars, and all of it under the President's personal control. Very little of this wealth trickles down to ordinary Turkmen and women, most of whom live in poverty and without jobs. The country is regarded as having one of the lowest life expectancy rates here in the region. Of course, these kinds of people are largely invisible to outsiders, to tourists and foreign media alike. Government minders restrict most visitors to the Orwellian splendours of Ashgabat. And besides, even if people did want to complain, the chances are they wouldn't for fear of retribution. He is brutal and violent. He's a leader who has used a whole range of methods against political opponents. Sometimes he's been happy to force them into exile. Uh, sometimes he's used long terms of imprisonment. Uh, sometimes he's used uh, even more severe methods. David Lewis can be critical of President Niazov, but from a distance. Today he's in London. Until recently, he was the Central Asia Director of the International Crisis Group, an institute for political analysis. He's clearly a largely paranoid leader. He uh, has very strange sort of behavioural patterns. Um, he's very dictatorial in his style, in behaviour, uh, and very untrusting of anybody around him. If there are similar voices of dissent inside Turkmenistan, you won't hear them. The level of repression means you have to leave the country to speak your mind. After the Soviet collapse, Avdi Kuliev was the first foreign minister of independent Turkmenistan. But he ran foul of the great Turkmenbashi and now lives in exile in Moscow. Declared an enemy of the people, Kuliev still fears for his life. Concerned that a television crew arriving at his house would arouse suspicion, a clandestine meeting was arranged instead. участники так называемой так называемого покушения 2002 года министры замминистры ну много людей которые известных людей бизнесмены всех их подвергают конечно пыткам жестоким пыткам 
Я считаю, что лучше получить, наверное, смертную казнь, чем сидеть в туркменской тюрьме. Three years ago, Boris Shikmuradov was part of President Niyazov's inner circle, Turkmenistan's foreign minister. We consider him not just a only president. He is a very strong consolidating factor. The nation is being consolidated just around him, and he is the leading political figure to uh, to create an atmosphere of social harmony in the country. The atmosphere of social harmony was short-lived. The foreign minister now languishes in jail after being blamed for an attempted coup. Shots were allegedly fired at the presidential motorcade. Boris Shikmuradov confessed on national television. The trial of Boris Shikmuradov was a farce, essentially. There was no due process involved. There was no defence allowed for Shikmuradov. The use of torture is widespread. Uh, former uh, inmates in the jails have given a lot of evidence about this, and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that Sheikh Murad was also uh, subject to torture while he was in prison, and we suspect that the confession uh, was a result of that. But this time, I think, because the race has been so close, there's been a lot of advertising. The United States maintains diplomatic relations with Turkmenistan while professing deep concern with human rights abuses in the country. We're also concerned about access to prisons. Uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross has cooperative relations with all four of the other governments of Central Asia and prison access in those countries. In Turkmenistan, no one so far has had access to the prisons. In a country that rivals North Korea for state-sponsored choreography and criminality, American concern stops short of actively lobbying on behalf of Niazov's imprisoned political opponents. We don't define people who were convicted in a coup attempt as a political prisoner because, in fact, a, a violent overthrow of a regime is illegal in any society. Iraq is obviously an exception to that rule. And for all the American rhetoric of spreading democracy around the world, in Turkmenistan, access to resources, riches and strategic influence dominate US policy. Certainly, we're very interested in gas and oil here. We were involved in an earlier effort uh, for a Trans-Caspian pipeline, which didn't work out. Uh, we're, we're very interested in, in following the economic development of the whole region and playing a positive role when we can. For all the pain and suffering the Azov has inflicted upon thousands of Turkmen families, he shamelessly exploits his own. This statue in Ashgabat is dedicated to his mother, who was killed along with a hundred thousand others when the city was devastated by an earthquake back in 1948. <laughs> Niazov's father was killed a few years earlier in the Second World War. Just last month, Niazov was in Moscow, meeting with Russian President Putin and other world leaders at the 60th anniversary of the Allies' victory over the Nazis. The one-time Soviet Communist Party chief is exploiting the end of the Cold War by retaining strong links with Russia and now currying favour with the United States. We believe that a prosperous and more democratic Central Asia is not only in the interest of the Central Asians themselves, but in the interest of the United States. While Niazov remains president, the prospect of a democratic Turkmenistan is fanciful. Turkmen teenagers and children are the victims of Niazov's paranoia and propaganda. He is the only leader they know. 
The Turpin Bashi cult is founded on the sympathetic story of an orphan boy. Вдохновление, дети гордятся этим, что вот за ними президент стоит, и вот он приходил, поздравлял детей. From a distance, it looks like a presidential palace. In fact, it's an orphanage. Costing more than $20 million, it comes courtesy of Niazov and his personal friend, another president, the late Sheikh Zayed of the United Arab Emirates. Нашим детям, что они не сироты, за ними стоит государство. Такое великое государство за этими детьми стоят. И что они не сироты, и они не должны себя считать сиротами. Turkmen Bashi claims an affinity with his country's orphans. There are more than 300 here, and when it comes to education, they are the fortunate ones. Few other schools in this country boast facilities of this quality. Many Turkmen children receive little or no formal education. President Niazov has taken a deliberate policy of essentially dumbing down the Turkmen population in colloquial terms. He's taken out several years of education from the schooling program. The university program has been cut to just two years. Almost every year, the phony People's Parliament ends with the man who's already declared himself president for life, announcing that the time has come to find a successor. It is a test of loyalty his ministerial acolytes pass with flying colours by furiously denouncing such an idea as unthinkable. The political striptease whips the audience into a frenzy and in Turkmenistan they applaud as if their very lives depend on it. Thank you.